بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وجعل ما نتعلمه يا إلهنا حجة لنا لا علينا طيب Alhamdulillah, uh, starting uh, nice and early again today, insha'Allah ta'ala, we have a lot of material to get through. But what we wanted to do is really to reward you, uh, brothers and sisters, who've made this effort to come here nice and early, mashaAllah, tabarakallah, by alhamdulillah, the brothers have really pulled it together. They've done a lot of work to block out the sunlight. And one of the brothers, mashaAllah, tabarakallah, jazahullahu khaira, has brought us a, a projector that will show us the images in a little bit more detail. So what we want to do, inshallah, is just to spend maybe 15, 20 minutes going over the videos that we showed you yesterday that you weren't able to see. Okay? So inshallah ta'ala, we're just going to go through them one by one in no particular uh, order. And this is the first one. This one was an example of some magic that was found. And we want you again to count what you find in there. So you can see there a dead uh, bird, chicken. What do you think that chicken would have been for? Sacrifice. Magicians in general, the primary means of coming close to the shaitan that they use is sacrifice to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the major, major things that they use. You will almost always find, not always, but you will almost always find that the means of offering to the shaitan is sacrifice. And they're now examining the bird. It may well have sihr inserted in the cavity of the bird or stitched into the wing of the bird. So they examine the bird carefully. Now count the number of eggs. The eggs sometimes have themselves things written on them, ta 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 uh, talismans, symbols, signs, numbers. But these eggs are plain. If the egg is colored red, what do you think that might be for? Love. Love. Good. So he said that there were 11 eggs and 11 knives and 11 razor blades. These numbers have a purpose. Somebody said, and it's a very valid question, why do these numbers have a purpose? Why not just the shaitan, you know, just go and kill him? Why do this? Allah Azza wa Jal knows best, but it seems that the, the shayateen this is, their, this is their knowledge, this is the way that they act. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how it happens. But this is, the, this is their methodology, this is their knowledge, this is what they pass on to the people. When they include those 11 of each, it's intended with a purpose. And then you have pins, and watch, they look at, they're counting the number of pins. They're putting the pins onto the edge of the cardboard in order to count the number of pins. Looking at this, looking at what came out, what, what of the, which one of the four elements was this person? Do you think likely? Some people said air. Who else thinks anything different? I think earth because I think it's unlikely that this stuff in the box would have been tied to a tree or something like that. I think almost certainly this box would have been buried somewhere. In general, you would find it difficult to tie this stuff to a tree. But Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. You can see some kind of like uh, maybe lentils or something like that in the picture. And they're examining them. They're examining to see what's in there. What else might be in there that they don't have. 
They already know how many they're expecting to find because they know the counting, but they're checking. Maybe it's not 11, could be 15. So they are, watch, they're counting to make sure they've got all of the needles. Making sure they've got all of the eggs. Making sure they gather everything together. Don't let stuff fall away on the side. We want to destroy it completely in every single way. They examine the bird again. Make sure that there's nothing in it. Make sure there's nothing in the cavity, nothing on the wing. And then they're going to destroy it in the most appropriate way that they can. You will not be able to burn some of this stuff. You can see quite clearly that you will not be able to burn it. But you can put some of it into the water and so on and so forth. Okay, let's have a look at some more. This is the work that was done in Jeddah. They go into the sea in Jeddah and they found, they have divers. You can see there are divers going into the sea. There are people, uh, cleaners and workers who are all working together to extract as much of the magic that has been dumped in the sea at every Hajj time out and they do this every single year they have divers out there on dinghies and boats that are diving and examining the seabed to see the magic that has been thrown into the sea and all of the people in the magic here that's been thrown into the sea they are all people who the magician have calculated them to be water from the four elements and again, a brother said, well, what if, what if they don't use the four elements? The jinn attack whoever they want by the, by the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal. But it seems that when they get the elements right, the jinn do seem to do more for them and they seem to get more out of the work that they do. And you can see here some of the different types of the magic that they found and they're going to start opening it up. And you're going to see the reality of the magician time and time again, ya ikhwan. You're going to see the reality of the magician time and time again all the time they are opening these things they're reciting 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 blowing reciting blowing reciting this is how you keep yourself safe this is how you protect yourself from the effects of the sihr because you're handling black magic you're handling something that is associated with the jinn perhaps the jinn are attached to those pieces of things that you see there Perhaps there are jinn that are sent to guard them, jinn that are sent to protect them. But you protect yourself and you destroy the magic with the permission of Allah by reciting the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can see, look at, look at how they've done this magic. Look, you've got bottles, you've got things. Some of this will just be rubbish. As they're extracting it, some of it may be rubbish that's been thrown into the sea. But as they're determining it, they have a team of people from the Hayat al-Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi al munkar the committee for the promotion of virtue and the prevention of vice and they are opening up each particular thing sometimes you may not be able to open the box ya ikhwan you may not be able to do it without reciting on it without asking allah azza wa jal without praying two rak'ah and asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you tawfiq without sitting and taking some time to make dua for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for you there may be a jinn holding down the circling the box holding down the lid of the box but alhamdulillah none of them can stand in the way of the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. Knots, you must break all of the knots. It's easier to do it with a razor blade than it is to do it with scissors. With scissors you can miss the very fine knots. With a razor blade you'll get all of them. So have a box of, open, of, of loose razor blades with you. Cut the knots open. The brother here is opening up this box that has been put into the sea. And look how they've made this effort to stop the seawater from destroying what's inside. And we're going to see what's inside and we're going to see what the reality of the magician is. And what the magician does on a daily basis. This is not one or two magicians that disgrace the Qur'an. This is every single magician. They have all the tools there. They've got some strong knives. They've got some scissors. They're going to break it open between the two of them. And they're going to try and find out what's inside of the box. And finally, they've been able to open the box. Inside the box, there is some mud. And it's designed to protect what's inside. To safeguard what's inside. 
because we said when they destroy the contract the jinn no longer will fulfill the magic that they've been asked to fulfill so they're checking is this perhaps dirt is it bukhur maybe is it some kind of dirt that's been sacrificed to other than Allah blood has been spilt on it to sacrifice to other than Allah Azza wa Jal you must be careful afterwards to seriously wash your hands because these people are filthy man they 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 urinate on it they they put blood on it they they absolutely filthy filthy people I don't know why he doesn't wear gloves I think it's Saudi yeah so any mashallah tarakallah any just get your hands dirty if you're gonna do it just get your hands to go go and get your hands dirty so he's gonna try and get out what's in the box and wallah opening these ta'weeth it's not easy you know subhanallah you do you have to absolutely have in yourself trust in Allah Azza wa you may not find it you may be looking at the sihr and you might not be able to see it when you go in to get it out of a grave and we're gonna show you the one in the grave in a moment you the grave is huge how are you gonna find it unless you trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't trust in the jinn Oh, the jinn will show me where it is. The jinn lie. Sadaqaka wa huwa kadhub. He told the truth and he is a great liar. Subhanallah, the jinn lie. Don't trust in the jinn to tell you where it is. But trust in Allah Azza wa Jal to show you where it is because Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who sees the black ant crawling on a black rock in the depth of the night. There's nothing that's hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to see what's inside of this as he takes out the, the stuff that's been done from here and in front, inside of the other packet as well and I'll just maybe perhaps forward this for you slightly because it's quite long we want to show you what the result is okay maybe we're getting to results here we have some looks like a tamima looks like an amulet possibly it's difficult to see don't rush to judgment it could be anything but it does look to me, initially, it looks like to be an amulet, something with writing on. You need to check everything that you take off for knots. Everything you take off, you need to check it for knots. This is some kind of plastic bag that's there to preserve. Everything that's over the top is there to preserve the magic that's inside. There are, again, it seems to be wrapped in some kind of cloth. The cloth itself, you don't know. Maybe the cloth itself has magic on it. Check everything carefully. In the end of the day, if you have any doubt, stick it in your rukia water. If you want to clean it pure, make sure. Is there anything on it? If you want to, you can uh, get rid of it at the end with everything else. It looks to be, there is to be some kind of animal, uh, some kind of, uh, some, some kind of something from an animal inside. Perhaps an animal horn. They use this of an animal that's been slaughtered to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're just gonna move forward slightly. Okay, you're gonna see what's inside of the bag now. They use all of, and this is when we talk about magic developing. Magic doesn't develop, it's nothing new, it's the same magic inside. But it develops in just the way that they preserve it. Now they use plastic preserving and they use padlocks and they use... But it's the same, it's the same magic. It's the same system, it's the same coming close to the shaitan that they do. But they'll do their best to try to make it difficult for you. So when we're going to open this up, we're going to see what's inside of this uh, bag. There seems to be some paper. Maybe this is the thing that has written on uh, the magic. It appears to be blood. There appears to be blood stains inside. Again, remember the rules. Okay, this is, the, this is where they start to open it up and they find in here, what you have is you have a woman's sanitary towel. And it's a used sanitary towel and you have it covered in menstrual blood. As soon as you see that, what are you going to stop doing? Reciting the Qur'an over it until you've cleaned it. Okay, because we're not going to blow the Qur'an onto menstrual blood. But you must clean it. Why? Because maybe the thing that you need to recite Qur'an over is on there. And maybe the magician thinks, I know an easy way to stop you doing it. I'll just smear the writing. 
But when you clean it to the best of your ability and you purify it and then you're able, you know, with rose water or with something that smells very strong, has a very nice smell, you know, put some cider in there or something and, you know, give it sort of, remove the dirt and remove the, the uncleanliness and you'll see the magic is written inside of all of these things. And there are many, many things in the long, it's a long video. You have here congealed blood and you have all kinds of stuff that is hooked inside. They've, they've found another kind of a, some kind of thing. It might be a coconut shell or something like that, which also has the magic inside. That was an example of the water magic that we showed you, okay? Now we're going to show you an example of the air magic. Okay, here you have a bird and this uh, poor bird has had the magic, I believe this is the one that has had the magic stitched into its wing. Can you see that? The bird has had the magic stitched into its wing. And they use particular color of birds, sometimes, sometimes black, sometimes white, according to what the jinn command them to do. It's not a fixed rule, but the jinn will command them to do certain things. The jinn will say to them, bring a white bird, tie it to the foot of a black bird, bring me a blind rat, bring me uh, a one-eyed dog, bring me this and that and the other, bring me a, a sheep that looks like a vulture. Honestly, they will ask and ask and ask. And sometimes, why do they ask, Ya Ikhwan? This is very important. Why do they ask? Because they know you can't get it. And then when you can't get it, what do they do instead? They say, no problem, I will sacrifice for you, give me 10,000 pounds. And I will bring you a sheep that looks like a vulture. I will bring you a blind rat. I will bring you an orphan mouse. An orphan mouse. How do you know what mouse is an orphan? I want an orphan mouse, a mouse that's mother and father, that, or that's father is dead. Bring me an albino rat. People, you see them, wallahi, in some countries you see them in the sewers. People going through the sewers, you're, what are you doing? I'm looking for an albino rat. Subhanallah, in places like Morocco, they sell the animals on the street and they sell the sihr on the street. There are shops where they sell black magic artifacts. We can sell you an albino rat, we can sell you a one-eyed dog, we can sell you, uh, you know, a, a sheep that looks like a vulture. You can see this is what was written on. You can see the symbols exactly like the ta'aweel. And you know when someone has gone to the effort of tying it to a bird like that, this is going to be some major magic. But don't think, look, Allahumma. Don't think that they don't write Allah's name. Don't think that they don't write uh, ayat of the Quran. Jibreel. Words from the Quran. Tayran Ababil. Tayran Ababil. Here we have Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. If this was tied to a bird in this way, be certain that this contains seeking help from the shaitan and magic that was done for somebody. Because nobody is going to stitch something to the wing of a bird for no reason. This has been done and this looks exactly like many of the ta'aweed that are hung around the necks of the people. And yet it is full of ayat, but they, what are they doing? They're disgracing the ayat of the Qur'an. What is this paper? Sometimes the shaykh, he said, you will find a paper and it has nothing written on it but the pure Qur'an. And the shaykh said, then we smelt something and we realized the paper had been dipped in urine. And then they had written the ayat of the Qur'an. They give it to someone and say, look, ayat al kursi. And it's been dipped into urine. This is the action of what the magicians do. Let's have a look at another one. Let's have a look at earth magic inside of a grave. And look at the shuyukh, what they do. This is their job, day in, day out. Down they go into the grave and a magician had phoned up. Someone had made the tawbah or someone had phoned up anonymously and said, if you go to this grave, you will find either the person who asked for the magic or the magician. And they're looking and looking to see what can we find. Can we find anything in the base, in the bottom of this uh, thing, any action? And then they found this little carrier bag. They found this small carrier bag. 
So now they're content that they found the magic, but they're always going to look for more. Because the same magician may have put more than one magic piece in this grave. And then they open up the carrier bag. Let's see what's inside of the carrier bag. Knots. Knots around the outside. They're going to be broken with razor blades. Look at what's inside. Straight away you can see blood. And we think this is menstrual blood. Okay, what, what can you see guys? You can see a red egg, a red egg. Okay, I'm gonna tell you what you can see here, what you might not be able to see. Here what you can see, and I want you guys to interpret this for me, okay? Make notes if, you, if it helps you to revise it, if it helps you to think of it, okay? What you can see is a red egg. A sanitary towel covered in menstrual blood a child's nappy a soiled nappy from a child now let's carry on the video keep going and whatever you see we're gonna write it down okay the egg has pins in it okay so if you wrote down the egg the egg has pins in it there's a child's nappy here you have a lemon that has been cut in half or a lime. You have a citrus lemon or a lime, it's been cut in half. You have the head of a bird, some kind of bird, perhaps a chicken. You have the head of a bird, okay? You have a, a, a lime or a lemon that has been cut in half. A menstrual pad, a child's nappy that's been used. And you have some sort of writings possibly on the inside. You have this half of the lemon or the lime and you have a tissue, a handkerchief is tied to the egg. Tied to the egg is a man's handkerchief. Count the pins. One. Let's check it. Mashallah, this sheikh is brave, man. He puts the pins in his he puts the pins in his glove. He uses his plastic glove to store the pins. <laughs> and Allah understand. Maybe buy him a pin box or something. Seven pins. Let's fast forward to the end of the pins. And we have, this is another, I think this might be another lemon. So you have here, they're showing you, just have a look. You have this lemon or lime, you have this egg with seven pins in it, it's colored red. Attached to one of the pins is a man's handkerchief. There's a child's nappy and a woman's sanitary towel. Now, we know why this magic was done. The magician was caught and by the, the mercy and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was executed for his or her crime, along with the people who supported them and the people who worked with them in order to have the magic done, the assistance and so on and so forth. So tell us now, guys, let's have some thoughts from you. And the sisters as well, I want you just to think in your own mind. What do you think this magic was done for? We start with the brother in the middle. Was it to like bring a family together? To see that's like a kid and was the, um, maybe the blood from a woman that wanted to get a husband like this? Okay, so we have bringing a family together. Bringing uh, someone close to their wife and child. Bringing someone close to their wife and child. This to stop a family from having children. To stop a family from having children. Okay, let's deal with stopping a family from having children first. Why is this magic definitely not to stop a family having children? Because of the number seven. There are seven pins. It's not to push people away and to stop something happening. It's to bring something together. The brothers were broadly right. What was done was a woman was divorced by her husband. 
and he got custody of the child and she wanted to bring her husband back with the child to her so you have something of the child the nappy it's disgusting it's dirty but it's got the dna it's got the the scent or the whatever you call it you know the dna the sweat the the effect the 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 bodily uh, effects of the child in it so that the jinn can identify the child we have menstrual blood it's dirty it's disgusting but it's going to identify the woman you have a man's handkerchief with his you know what he's blown his nose into so again you have the effects of the man the handkerchief is nailed with seven pins to a red egg red is for love okay the pins the seven pins are for bringing people together so she's try someone is trying to bring a man back to her and the child's nappy and the story is and it was found when they were arrested that the child here uh, had been given in custody to the father and the woman had gone to a magician in order to do this magic and the magician had done what he had done and of course the bird what is the bird for the sacrifice to the shaitan what's the lime or the lemon for the lime on the lemon, the Sheikh said, he said it suggests something bitter. Something bitter has happened. Something, there's still benefit in it, but it's bitter. And they use the lime or the lemon to represent the woman. Because it's something, she's, it's like she's gone bitter, she's gone sour, but she still has a benefit. It's a beneficial fruit, but it's gone sour and bitter. And there's a lot of symbolism in magic. So it's a symbolic thing to represent the fact that this woman has, because she's, become bitter she's become shriveled she's become very sour but at the same time there's still you know some benefit that they want to get out from her why, would they put it in the grave? why did they put it in the grave very good question why did they put it in the grave guys they calculated for the husband or for the child Allah knows best how they calculated and they calculated for them and they determined that this person was from the element of earth and they put the uh, the package into the grave and Allah knows best how they did it did they add the child and the father together and divide it or did they just go by the father because the child will follow the father Allah knows best we're not here to know the details of how the people practice magic but to know enough that we can call the people to Tawheed why are we learning these symbols and these amulets and these signs to help you break the magic to help you break the amulets and to help you call the people when he says my sheikh you know mashallah he has control of the good jinn he just asked me for the child's nappy he just asked me for you know something of mine he asked me for this he asked me for a lemon he just asked me to sacrifice something he sacrificed it one point we must be aware of if he sacrifices he will not sacrifice on his own. Why? He has to call that woman to shirk. She has to be involved. He has to call her to bring it to her or her to hold it for him or her to buy it for him. She has to be involved in shirk. A sahir cannot do sihr unless he calls the people to shirk. He has to call the people to shirk. If he doesn't call the people to shirk, he will not be able to do his magic. They found out about this, I know Allahu Alam, they mention lots of stories. Sometimes people phone up, sometimes the woman herself, she starts to experience bad things and she repents and she phones up. Sometimes they catch the magician for something else. They do sting <coughs> operations. We might be able to show you one. Yeah, we've, got, we've seen this one. No, no doubt everyone will be punished, but it depends. They have their laws like so the assistants, I think, get life imprisonment and the people who go, they get a certain length of term in prison uh, and, uh, you know, they may get other punishments carried out. Um, we've been through the water and we've been through the air and the earth. We didn't, we didn't think it difficult for the nails. I'm going to go through this one. Okay, here we can see another example of something that was buried in the earth. See the, am the amulets here. See the letters that are written upon them. We see inside here, this is opened up, this is buried again in the earth. 
And again, they're opening up these amulets. And there's loads of these videos on YouTube. We just picked a few that give you a good idea of what the, the, the magic is like. This says it is to be buried in a grave. Tudfanu fi qabrin. It's to be buried in a grave. So they tell it that it has to be buried in a certain grave. They send the magician will give this to the person and say, go and bury it in the grave. Go to this grave and bury it. Or they'll give it to their assistant and tell them to bury it in the grave. And this is the package that the shuyukh they found uh, here in the grave. One more I want to find for you guys. Here. Okay, this is a sting operation. Okay, this is a sting operation by the Hayat al Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahin al Munkar. You have concealed uh, the, the officials from the committee are concealed in the car filming the situation and they're now going to make a move on the magician. <coughs> They're going to pull him over. And let's see what this magician has brought with him. Don't they ever try and get away? Yeah, no doubt. But I think it, until this point, it's not clear. Like, they're, they're going to jump out the car. He stopped at the person's house now, and they're going to jump out the car. And he is along with the police. Here you see the policeman who is arresting him. Let's see what this person has got in the back of the car. This is a sheep or a goat that is, that is supposed to look like a vulture. So, and, and what did he say he was going to do? He said, bring me a sheep or a goat that looks like a vulture. And they couldn't do it. So he said, I will bring one for you for 10,000 rials or whatever. And uh, what he said is he was going to the toilet in their house to sacrifice it inside of the toilet. And so they were able to arrest him and they were able to take his things from him to perform a search to make sure does he have ta'weed often the magician will have many ta'weed on him on his own body for himself or for others to punish himself or to uh, or to try to protect himself and at the moment he doesn't know exactly what he's doing he's trying to claim that he's innocent that it's just a regular animal that he just happened to be bringing but why do you think, guys, why do you think that they didn't let him slaughter the animal? Why not catch him in the act? Why not catch him? Wouldn't it be better to catch him in the act, slaughtering the animal in the toilet? Not because of the magic, why? They don't allow him to commit shirk. You can't allow somebody to commit shirk. They will give him, a, let him get to a certain point but they will not, they waited until he stopped, until he took the animal and he was walking into the house with the animal, then that's as far as they let him go. Because they will not allow somebody to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's have a look at a few more examples that we didn't have a look at yesterday. This was the example of the masahif that have been covered in feces and urine and they're purifying these masahif, they're tied with amulets and they've been dumped into somewhere filthy, maybe a sewer or into the ground. And there are 51, as far as I remember, there are 51 of the masahif tied together with knots and ta'aweed and amulets. And they're cutting open the knots. Notice he's got himself a, a, a sharp blade for cutting open the knots, they're reciting the Qur'an 
over the knots <coughs> and they are washing uh, look how they're keeping all of the effects together it's very important you don't let any go you don't want to leave a knot or two Alhamdulillah you break the magic but you don't want to leave anything at all left in the person and look at the amount of work and then they're putting rose water and they're putting other kinds of nice smelling and nice uh, scented water in order to wash the pages of the Mus'haf and the Mus'haf will eventually be burnt uh, as to get rid of the Mus'haf or it will be thrown into the sea but they want to purify it first they want to take away the urine and the feces that's been spread upon it so they're using the rose water to wash or the Mus'haf you can see here for a second the inside of the Mus'haf there are uh, metal hooks and this is part of what has been done to implement the sihr similar to knots these metal hooks have been put on and you can see how it is covered in excrement it's covered in filth and they're having to wash each individual page of the Mus'haf the Shaykh said we opened up the pages of the Mus'haf one by one by one and we, we washed them with smelly water to try to remove some of the filth from them and this is why Ikhwan, Ruqya and fighting against magic is from the highest forms of Jihad fi sabilillah. this is making the word of Allah the highest taking someone who has made the word of Allah the lowest and has tried to do so and they will not be successful and then purifying it and washing it and cleaning it and making the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the highest look at the filth that is coming off these masahif into the water and you can see, look at the number of Masahif. And they're going through each page of the Mus'haf, one by one by one, and they're putting perfume on the page. They got the expensive kind of oud, the most expensive kinds of perfume, and they're perfuming the pages of the Mus'haf out of respect for the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after it being desecrated in that filthy way. Out of curiosity, is there any reason why they don't wear gloves? Allahu A'lam Here you can see This is something that has been A mushaf that's been desecrated With menstrual blood It's been inserted into the private parts Of a woman The magician So that she could bleed over it And to disgrace the words Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And again the brothers are going to Purify the mushaf they're going to clean it, they're going to perfume it and then they're going to eventually dispose of it in a permissible way such as burning or as we say there's three ways to dispose of the Mus'haf to burn, to bury or to dispose of it in water uh, in a way that is appropriate so that the words of Allah Azza wa Jal are not disgraced and desecrated look at how they had scrumpled up bits of the Qur'an into pieces and she had, she had used them uh, as like a sanitary towel and this is not something that is unusual. This is something that is very normal and it is a common practice of these magicians, these people who don't fear with regard to a believer anything whatsoever. Um, you know, if you were cleaning someone like this, would you bring it home to do it or would you do it somewhere like In general, I want you guys to have a rule. I don't generally want you to bring the ta'aweed into the house. And again, alhamdulillah, if you have your house protected and you read your adhkar, you'll be safe. But just as an extra precaution, don't bring your ta'weed into the house. Keep them somewhere in the office. Keep them in you know, the, a place where it's a public place like uh, the, you know, the masjid or something. Put them you know, in on a community somewhere you know, in, your, in your car or something. Don't keep these in your house and dispose of them if you can. Now I put them sometimes because I have no choice. But in general, this is the advice of the Shaykh, and I think it is in general good advice. I think it's decent advice, you know, and just to keep yourself and your family, you know, to keep yourself confident that you're not bringing something into the house that is shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you do so because you want to get rid of it, inshallah, there's no there's no harm gonna to come to you, inshallah. We saw the picture of the sewer before, and we saw the brother who climbs down into the sewer and then from the sewer that is covered in feces and, and excrement he is taking out the mushaf you can clearly see it's covered in feces it's covered in excrement and it contains here you have the mushaf and you have some of the actions that were done to perform magic upon somebody
Let's go to the next one now. This is the guy who is uh, showing the actions that he does as a magician. So he's dressing up in these red clothes, of course claiming it to be permissible. He said we do so because the shaitan tells us that we are allowed to wear red and the best color is red. And of course the Prophet ﷺ forbade a man to wear exclusively red clothes from top to bottom. He has this red sort of prayer mat. He lights the incense. Again, there's nothing wrong with incense to perfume your house. But this is incense with the intention, the niyyah. It's the same incense. But the niyyah is what? To bring the shaitan close. And they're using incense that is beloved to the shaitan. Then he is going to call the shaitan. Come to me. He's, gonna, he's calling the shaitan. And then he begins to whip himself. And no doubt if he was doing it properly, he would have done it for a lot longer than that. And then what would he do? He would slaughter a bird and allow it to fly. Of course, they won't let him do it here, but you can see the blood that is spilt all over the curtains. He has these curtains on the wall, knowing that the Prophet ﷺ forbade such a thing, you know, the hanging of these things all over the walls. And what he does is he then takes a bird, he sacrifices the bird, and he, he cuts it in a way that it lives for some time and he throws it up, letting the blood spill all over the room as a sign of his sacrifice to other than Allah Azza wa Jal. And as you can see, this magician is not from, I don't think from Saudi, from Saudi Arabia, um, but it doesn't matter, they all do very similar things. They all do very, very similar things. And then he shows what he would do. He's got some of his uh, tools that he uses here, some of his uh, things that he has knots in, and some of the things that he uses to hurt himself with or to call the shaitan with. But he's going to show now what he does when he goes to sleep. He says he doesn't go to sleep like you and I go to sleep. He has some, you can see he's got some uh, bukhur there, some... Uh, sort of herbs and things he doesn't go he doesn't go to to sleep like we go to sleep this is how he is commanded to go to sleep but he doesn't show he doesn't show it in full because they won't let him but he's saying I make sajda I make sajda and they're not letting him make sajda but he's trying to describe what he does and then they make him sleep like this this is how he's commanded to sleep in a state of humility and obedience to the shaitan in a state of humility and obedience to the shaitan. That's how he's commanded to sleep, like this. Was he killed? <clears throat> All of them were either killed or are waiting to be killed. All of them were either killed or are waiting to be killed. Let's have a look at the magician in a cave. <coughs> We're just gonna do five more minutes, but I wanna show you as many of these videos as possible that you couldn't see yesterday. This is the magician in the cave. You see the triangles, the circles, the symbolism, the candles. Each color candle has a purpose. I remember that red is to do with love and to do with bringing, the, 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 the bringing, and one of them is for the separation. And he sits in this circle, and in this circle he's commanded to go to the toilet and to sit in his own excrement, and he's commanded to sit and to begin to recite what he knows as his adhkar, his dhikr. This is the cave that he sits in. He lights his candles. And he sits upon this little mat that he's commanded to go to the toilet on. And he begins doing his dhikr. Look at him. He looks like he's doing dhikr. And he does so until the shaitan come to him. Many of them will say that they spend 40 days. And you hear many stories, even amongst the Hindus, you hear the same thing. 40 days in, in alone, away from everyone and everything else, sitting and not washing, not bathing, not praying, nothing. Until the shaitan come to them. And it's the same thing that is done by the mutasawwifah. The same thing that you get from the Sufis. 
They do exactly the same thing, they're khalwa. Yeah. They call it chilla. They have many names for it. They Just a quick question. Um, in one of the tafsirs in, in, in the Quran, um, there was this, there was small explanation saying that if you go somewhere in the forest and you know recite Surah Jinn for 40 days and nights, then mm. the jinns come to you. <coughs> no doubt. If you go, it, the they don't recite. They don't recite Surah Al Jinn. They go to the forest and maybe the first time they recite Surah Al Jinn. Then after that they say, shall I not tell you what is quicker than Surah Al-Jinn? Don't waste 40 days. If you recite Surah Al-Jinn, it'll take you 40 days. I'll tell you what's quicker to get the good jinn to come to you. What's quicker to get the good jinn to come to you? Just say, who, 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 loads of times. And then they become a sahir. The, j- the shaitan, look how the shaitan, how the shaitan tricks the people. He begin by saying, go into the forest, read Surah Al-Jinn. Go into the forest for 40 days. Subhanallah, you'll see what will happen to them. This is the stone that is mentioned in the Harry Potter books and these are some of the artifacts that are used by magicians if we move forward and it is a Persian stone meaning protection from poison look at the belief that they're teaching the children there's nothing wrong with magic it's a lovely thing the protection from poison the stones that give you life Some of this we can't show in the masjid, but here are the pictures. This is one of Alistair Crowley's. I'm going to forward that because that's a picture of her. Like you can see that they how they have. These are some of the pictures of the shayateen that they have here. A picture of the shaitan as they see him there with his horns. We know that the shaitan has these horns. Whether they are like this or whether they are like anything else, Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. But this is the image of them that they make, and these are all of the the horned god. These are all of the, the pictures that these people use, the sacrificial altars that they sacrifice on to other than Allah Azza wa Jal. These are the items of male genitalia that they use in order to encourage reproductive capability or to stop people from having children and they attach them with their magic. And these devices were used in to collect fluids, to collect parts of, uh, you know, fluids from men and so on and so forth. And those fluids were to be used in coming close to the jinn and in performing the magic. This is something, Ya Ikhwan, that you can barely look at. You can barely look at it without feeling absolute disgust. Let us see it in more detail. This uh, shaitan who dresses up like a wali from the awliya of Allah Azza wa Jal. And he says this man has a jinn in him and he's going to cure this man from the jinn. So you can see this man is not willing, but he has this sword, this knife driven through his cheek. And of course, you can see how it works because they drive it through the flesh. So it's less, uh, it doesn't produce blood and stuff like that as much. The wound closes up. He's searching for the shaitan. Where is the shaitan in this man? And then the poor man is going to be dealt with with another sword through his stomach. Insert this sword through his abdomen. This is the so-called wali from the awliya of Allah. Look how he dresses like a Muslim. How he has a beard. And they're claiming their success in killing the jinn in this poor individual, this miskeen man. Do you know where this is? He is the sheikh of, uh, we just forward this, I think it's Syria. And I'll just give you the details of the name. They pull it out of him. And of course the jinn are involved and he is alleged. So this is the so-called Abdul Majid uh, Abul Aish, who is sheikh of tariqah uh, one of the Sufi tariqat in Syria. One of the Sufi tariqat in Syria. One, and it's the tariqa. What can you see? Let's say al-Rafa'iyya. Al-Rifa'iyya. One of the 
Sufi Tariqat. And this man, let's see what this man does. Let's have a look at what this man actually does. This is the same man. This is the same man, this Abdul Majid, this guy who is extracting his feces, how he's, whether he has a hole in his stomach or whether he's simply involving the shayateen and the jinn. It's enough that these people are covered in filth. Look at him celebrating. He's celebrating the fact that he is covered himself in his own filth. And then his followers go and this man is going to go and he's going to eat the excrement that comes out of the inside of this person. And he is considered to be one of the a'imma of the tariqah. One of the big imams of the tariqah sufiyah. One of the awliya of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is what they claim. And I think insha'Allah ta'ala that will suffice us. If we want we can have a brief look at uh, this shaitan from the shayateen, Alistair Crowley, and what he would do. And we might be able even to listen. This is some of the stuff that he does. He's a very famous magician who lived in the United Kingdom. He worshipped the Egyptian gods. And he involves elements of Islam and ancient Egypt in some of the things that he does. There's some of his books. This is some of the ritual magic that his order performs, the order of the golden dawn. These are one of the ta'weev that Alistair Crowley makes. You probably could have got that from your local imam in the masjid, subhanAllah. This is the kind of things that people are giving out in many of the masajid, Allahu musta'an. Many of the Messiah probably even in within a local area, even not too far in Birmingham, you could go and you could get the same ta'weed that Alistair Crowley used and they will say this is Ismullah al-Azam. This is the name of Allah the Great. This is the great name of Allah. Contains the seven names of Allah which even the angels are not able to pronounce. Made by Alistair Crowley. The seven names of Allah that even the angels are not able to pronounce. Exactly the same justification that is used by the Sufi who says, I make you a ta'weed, and in this ta'weed it has Ismullah al-Azam, and nobody knows this name of Allah except for me and my grandfather, and this is why it is so powerful and it can control the jinn, like the man who brought the throne of Bilqis alayhi salam to Sulaiman alayhi salam regarding uh, when the Ifrit, even quicker than the Ifrit, because he made dua to Allah with Allah's greatest name. They say that this is Allah's greatest name. But these are the names of the shayateen. We may be able to, at the very end, see it very close up. But you have here, Daimo, you have names of the shayateen, Bizkaz, you have names of the shayateen. Here you have the stars, you have the points, you have the khatam, the, the seal of the magician. And this is Alistair Crowley's seven names of Allah. So you see what these magicians are upon and you see what it is that they do. And I don't think this is something which is unclear to anybody. We're gonna...